he dropped. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Recording. No worries. <laughs> We're just getting into it. Yeah. So, um, rents have uh, been pretty stable. They, you know, those of us who are in the market, like I said, daily, we have rentals all the time. And um, yeah, we're seeing, you know, pretty much prices staying very stabilized. Uh, you know, like I said, there have been slight drops. I think that's more in the A class uh, than in the B and C class. Um, uh, yes, Naomi. Just quick question. So, Will, um, so which market, uh, where are you located mainly? What? Yeah, so we're in the Los Angeles market and and those surrounding areas. So uh, we're in LA City as well as um, as well as in you know all the surrounding areas uh, surrounding LA. So um, and obviously I'm talking about specifically I'm talking about the LA market. Obviously, different markets you know in different cities are have different temperatures based on whatever is going on locally. But I can just say that. With LA, generally speaking, what we've seen is that, you know, rents are pretty stable. Vacancy rates are pretty stable as well, even though, you know, there are still people moving out of California, there are always still people moving in. And so uh, we're we're not seeing a lot of changes in vacancy. Um, and like I said, we are starting to see some uh, movement on on listings uh, in, in, in ways that we hadn't seen for a while. Uh, and I think that Partly that's because, you know, there's been a lot of money on the sidelines, right? There've been a lot of people waiting on the sidelines. There's a lot of dry powder uh, with folks who have been waiting for kind of pick up deals. People on the big end, like the big the big family offices are buying like those big empty office towers right now, right? Those A-class office towers that are kind of just sitting there like 40, 50% vacant. People are buying those right now. So, um, so at, at a steep, steep discount. Um, and so I think that people are just kind of, um, they're just kind of, they're, people are starting to get off the sidelines, which is, which is nice to see. Um, so I'm going to share just a couple of quick listings that I have, um, uh, just to give you a, a flavor of, uh, what we're seeing. So, um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is a, um, this is a, a duplex in uh, kind of the Silver Lake Virgil Village area. Um, it's two units. Uh, both will be delivered vacant. One's a three bedroom, two bath. The other's a two bedroom, two bath. Um, you know, decent size. The nice thing about this, not only is it being delivered vacant, so it's a perfect owner user opportunity, um, but it's also a large enough lot. It's a uh, 7,500 square foot lot. So you can build up to 280 U's on the property and it's commercially zoned. So even if you wanted to, you could potentially tear down the duplex and build up nine units. Um, so another really nice thing about this property is that um, there is an assumable FHA loan on this. So you could potentially get a 3.25% interest rate, which we know is 50% of what typical interest rates are right now, right? I mean, typical interest rates we know are in the sixes. Uh, so to get a 3.25% loan, you know, is is really nice. Um, let's see if I can, yeah. So like I said, two renovated units, both delivered vacant, three bedroom, two bath, two bedroom, two bath. Uh, you know, there's a carport as you can see, but you could build, you could build ADUs in the back. Um, very centrally located, right in the heart of kind of that Silver Lake Virgil Village area, um, and uh, near the 101, near Sunset Junction, Echo Park, Filipino Town, downtown LA, the 101, all that stuff. Uh, so we are offering this for uh, 1395, and um, and so yeah, it's, I think it's a good starter pro property for a lot of folks. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously good solid rents in that area, which is always nice. Um, so let me, so that's that one. I, and I'll send you, I'll send anybody who's interested. I'll put my contact information in the chat. I can email these to you. Hey, so, well, real quick, do you know what, um, what are the market rents for those units? Yeah. So the, um, three bedroom, we're getting like 3,800 to 4,000. 
and the uh, the two veterans are getting like 32 to 34. So you're getting 7K plus, 7,400 roughly per month. So at that, um, let me go back. Uh, we did the numbers here. Uh, it was a, the cap rate was, oh, I don't know if we have the cap rate on here. Ken, can you help? Ken, Ken did this. Ken, can you help me out here? Do you remember what the cap rate is? All right. He might not. I think it's like a five fork. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, one second. Let me, let me pull that up for you. Yeah. I, I know it's in the fives. It's a five. It's definitely above a five cap once you get it fully re rented. So what's nice about this, right, is that you could you could buy this, you could rent them out or live in one, rent them out, whatever, get your income. And then if you want to build in the back, you, you're still you're not like losing in the meantime. Right. Like it's a it's a covered land play. Right. Which is really nice. So, um, OK, so let me move on. Um, Going to, so this is Casio. This one I'm getting a ton of activity on. This is a 10 unit uh, multifamily building, part of Pico Robertson, kind of uh, Beverly Wood area. It's funny because like literally yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article that said, why is everyone moving to Beverly Wood? <laughs> and right now, like on the single family side, Beverly Wood is just blowing up for whatever reason. So this is a multifamily 10 unit Owned by the original owners, they built it in 1958. Uh, you know, matriarch has passed, the kids are selling. Uh, great mix of one and two bedroom units. Two of the largest units, the two largest two bedroom units are being delivered vacant. Uh, so this is a great value add play for somebody. Um, 10 parking spaces, common laundry room. Uh, get Once you get those uh, two bedrooms, rented at market, which is we're, we're expecting about 3000, uh, you're getting a 13.12 GRM, a 5.34 cap. I mean, these are great numbers. Uh, so particularly in that area. So I think that that's why we're getting so much interest on it. Also with the parking, you could build two additional ADUs in that parking area. So, uh, so, you know, and this is about as central as it gets, right? You're, you're just South of Beverly Hills, you're next to West Hollywood. You're uh, right near La Cienega, Beverly Center, uh, Century City, uh, you know, straight shot on the 10 to West Side, an exposition line. Uh, this is like pretty much as central as you can get. Uh, and so we're getting a lot of um, a lot of activity on this one. If you're interested, I can send you the OM on either of these. Um like I said, great cap rate, great GRM. Uh, for those of you who don't know what GRMs are, gross rent multipliers and capitalization rates, um, we always do um, at the beginning of the year, like a real estate investing 101, where we go over what that means and how to value properties. And uh, we can we will be doing that again shortly. All right. So uh, before we get to our guest speaker, uh, just want to, um, I always like to open it up. Uh, A, are there any questions? B, uh, are there any needs, deals, or wants? Oh, I have one more. I Coming soon, I always, I always pitch these in this meeting before they go to market. So I have a coming soon. Uh, this is, uh, this is an interesting one. Currently, there are three units on the property. This is in Westlake. Uh, so just south of Echo Park, next to Filipino Town. So there's three units on the on the property, um, a couple ones and a couple twos, uh, a, a couple one bedrooms. No, I think it's three one bedrooms. My apologies. That's not the main thing though. The main thing. This is really a development play because it's zoned R three. You can build up to twenty five units on this property. So uh, so this is really a land play. Um, and um, so and we're going to be putting on the market for eight seventy five. So if you just did the per unit count, right? I mean, we're talking a very, very good. So this is just a land value play. Um, there are two tenants on the property. You know, uh, people have asked us, how how do you deal with you know, that? Usually, you, obviously you have to go through your entitlements and get that done. Uh, but typically in those situations, you LS Act the tenants. 
So if you have questions, if you have any interest on that one, let me know. That one has not come to market yet. Um, but if you're interested in either of the other ones, the Commonwealth Duplex uh, in Virgil Village or the 10 unit uh, in Pico Robertson, let me know. Um, now, like I said, this is the opportunity uh, before we get to our speaker um, uh, to, uh, if you have any needs, deals, or wants uh, for any of your clients or yourselves, if you're looking for something specific, uh, this is this is your opportunity. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, yeah, so one of my clients uh, is looking for probably mostly in the Valley, like Sherman Oaks, Tarzana, North Hollywood. Um, he, he runs a uh, detox rehab facilities and he's looking for like a brand new, like four unit, preferably like a small lot subdivision, um, that he, that he wants to lease for five years, you know, minimum 12 beds, um, and with an option to buy later. But, um, I mean, I, I have a lot of options for him, but if anybody knows of anything that's coming on to the market, even if it's for sale, um like four units for sale or for rent or whatever like that um you just want something new that's luxury ish um that he can rent out the whole facility for his business um around between like 20 25,000 total rent for the whole thing okay thanks brian yeah there's a lot of uh kind of sober living facilities that are coming on the you know that are looking for places like that so Definitely a very strong situation. Uh, Ken uh, put in the chat that the GRM for the Commonwealth duplex is 15.71 and the cap rate is 5.4. That's renting those units at market. Um, and for Anaz, as 4% is for rent control, that's for, yes, for rent controlled properties in LA City. That's 4% and then additional 1% each for gas and electric. Any other questions, needs, deals, or wants? Thank yes. you. Uh, I have a 1031 exchange from uh, Vegas to here. I like I did uh, micromanage it myself, and I'm just tired of it. I like to buy a property that I can manage myself. So the property I'm looking for is maximum to up to 1.5. If it's assumable loan, would be perfect. Uh, up to 1.5. I have a duplex for you in uh in, in <laughs> well, I know, Village. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. It looks Fair pretty enough. good. Give me a call, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you never know. right yeah. up your alley. That, that seems like it would be perfect for you if you want to exchange. I have <laughs> another, I have another option for Brian. If he's looking for, if the or if that person is looking to buy a property, I have a, uh, single family room that has an ADU that could be used for the office and it's three bedroom, two bath. He can, I have rented it three years to a sober living when I purchased it. And I think it would be a good, uh, it's not a fourplex, but it's something that he can think about for his client if he's not yeah. willing to rent. Uh, yeah, he, to curr purchase. he currently owns two like single families that he uses at two different locations. He just there wants something go. that has, he wants something that has more beds and he can put more people in. Oh, yeah. This is a three bedroom, two bath plus ADU, which is semi occupancy. I mean, the occupancy is almost finished and they can uh, actually, I'm paying for both units for rent control office. I've been paying since it's been rented and it's a, uh, uh, what you may call it. It's an investment for me. I've never lived in it. It's vacant right now. I'm thinking to put it in the market soon. Uh, I was thinking today as Valentine's Day as a gift to buyers. Great price. So contact me. Maybe this is a property for him to purchase instead of renting. Okay. Yeah, leave me your number in the chat. Sure, I will. Thank you, Brian. Any other questions or um, uh, needs, deals, or wants that anybody has right now? Uh, my main concern is maybe I do 1031 exchange uh, with uh, my investments out of Vegas and here in Woodland Hills. So if you find any multi-units that is 5, 4, and up, 
I'm all for it. And assumable loans would be easier. But if not, uh, if the like property- Like I said, Sharon, has... give me a call. Seriously, like you should look I at will. this. It's perfect. It seems perfect for what you're looking for. And uh, the, the thing is, I'm trying to uh, buy a multi-unit with both purchases doing 1031 to uh that is making already giving me rent so uh i can uh, qualify for a loan if i show income for the property that's easier to uh, qualify for a loan sure Absolutely. but you know as you know as a you're 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 the you're the chief you know that if you show income it's much easier to obtain is people are having a hard time with these high interest rates and if we're getting seven to eight percent. Very challenging. Uh, very challenging market in California. Yes. I mean, I'm thinking maybe if I cannot find that 1031 exchange, move to Florida, move my money to Florida or Austin, which is booming right now. Mm -hmm. FYI, but it's all about your decision, where you want to be and how you see the market. If Amazon is moving to Florida, maybe this is my time to move to Florida. <laughs> We awesome. never know. Just not call shorter for anybody, but it, uh, everybody's uh, situation is different. Right. Is there anyone else that has um, any needs, deals, or wants before we go to our speaker? Or any questions regarding the market or rent control, property management, any of those questions? This is the time to ask. Okay. I will uh, call well, you. You can also, yeah, feel free. I put my contact information in the chat. Uh, feel free to um, feel free to contact me uh, if you have any questions. Um, and then, uh, so right now, uh, and you can we can continue to kind of chat in the chat. You know, if you have questions, uh, you have continued um, concerns. You know, feel free to to reach out. Yes, Naomi. Thank you. So, you know, because she kind of brought it up, you know, I'm going to ask you to sure. kind of like, uh, you know, maybe say why people should invest here in LA. Good, good question. Good question. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I'm originally from the Midwest myself and I always ask the question, um, you know, what, any, anytime I'm working with a client, what are you looking for? Like, are you looking for cash flow? Or are you looking for appreciation? Usually you're going to get one or the other, right? Oftentimes, if you invest out of state or other places, you might get cash flow, but rarely, oftentimes you don't get appreciation. Sometimes you might get depreciation. Um, whereas in LA, the one thing is it's properties here are expensive. There's no doubt about it. So it's hard to cash flow, but the appreciation is almost always there, right? Um, so, so and, and why is that? Because vacancy rates are low. We are underbuilt housing wise. People need housing desperately, and um, you know our 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 vacancy rates are always below five percent, you know, and that is very rare across the rest of the country, you know, and for that reason, uh, you know, there's always, you know, someone once said like the dirt in Cal you know, in LA is has risen more than any other asset in the history of the world. <laughs> like it's just, it's insane, you know, like what what that's the reason why people invest in LA. And I'm happy to, to discuss that further with anybody, you know, about why it is. You know, obviously it's a challenge there's always challenges in every market. Um but if you live here and you work here um you know and you've built your life here, you know, there are lots of opportunities you know, to get into the market. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, Nicole Green of Robert Hall and Associates. Um, I am a personal client of Robert Hall and Associates. I work with the CEO, uh, Steve Hall, Stephen Hall, uh, and, um, you know, on my own personal taxes. And the reason is because they're known primarily as a real estate friendly CPA firm. You know, they really know and understand uh, real estate investors and uh, their needs and concerns. And so um, Nicole's going to talk to us today about all the tax uh, implications for real estate professionals 
and uh, things that you need to know. I know some, many of you here are here specifically to hear about this. Obviously, great timing. We've got taxes due in two months. And, uh, you know, and with that, I'll let Nicole take it away. Good morning, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, I'm going to start with sharing my screen. So, yes. Uh, I'm with Robert Hall and Associates. Robert Hall and Associates has been around for years and years and years, uh, over 50 years. Um, I, before got into taxes, I was a professor at a university. I spent, uh, well, nearly over a decade in education and people always say like, wow, that's such a crazy switch to go from education to tax, but really it's not. <laughs> all you're doing all the time is educating people on how you can use the different strategies, how you can use the tax code to benefit you. We don't have flat tax here in the United States. It's a beautiful thing because you can manipulate this system to fit your needs, your desires, your dreams. Uh, your taxes follow you for two, three years and not paying attention to your taxes is such an issue. But, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. How do people learn about taxes? It's a lot of, I hear from so-and-so, I watched a TikTok, I heard a YouTube, I was in this meetup, I went here. It's not like you learn about it in school or anything like that. And so I greatly, greatly take an importance in informing my community, my public of like what they can do um, because taxes are fun, like taxes are fun. Here are some of the senior consultants at Robert Hall. Um, again, we've been around for over 50 years. We've won countless awards because we've been such a staple in uh, the community. Uh, we are based in Glendale, but we do work nationally. Um, we do everything. If we can't do it, we can connect you with someone because the things that just frustrate us so much is when we lay out strategies for people and then they're like, okay, I don't know how to do it. And so we make sure that people have the tools and the connections to go ahead and continue with their strategies so that they can fulfill, you know, whatever their tax goals are. So that includes estate planning, that includes accounting, bookkeeping, auditing, like, you know, we, we, we got it all. Um, I'm not going to be, because of the time limit, I might not be able to get to everybody in their specific questions. I highly recommend setting up a second opinion where you can sit down with one of the senior consultants. You can, we can look at your taxes and we can answer your questions. Um, it's free. We do it for 30 minutes. We really like to, uh, give some education without going through paywalls. Um, it just allows for us to have one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of times, I mean, Obviously, <laughs> I get to ask tax questions all the time, and I absolutely don't mind answering the tax questions, but sometimes I need more specifics um, before I can actually give like a really genuine answer or like a full answer. And um, this is why we have these 30 minute consultations so people can get their answers that they want. And then we can also see if there's something that we could do to help what your situation is, something that you don't know, maybe, you know, we can give you a little advice or something that's going on. And so uh, you can scan the QR code. You can email me, nicole.green at Robert Hall Taxes. You can text 72,000, um, and then we can set you up with an appointment. If you just have a question, you can also just send me an email to nicole.green at Robert Hall Taxes. I just want everybody to understand that this is educational. I'm here just giving some information. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an agent. I'm just giving some information on some of the specialties that I have. Okay, let's get into it. If you guys have questions while I'm speaking, I go ahead, interrupt me, raise your hand. I will stop to see if you guys have questions throughout um, just so that we can you know, stay on topic. Um, okay, so does the tax code benefit real estate professionals? And the answer is absolutely yes. The tax code is built for families and the tax code is built for business owners and real estate professionals. The government wants people to buy property. The government wants people to invest. When people buy property, 
um, and continuously own property, they are helping the society as a whole because they're either renting it out or they're stabilizing themselves, which means that there's less issues if, when they're retiring. And so the tax codes will benefit you. There, let's talk about some of the main deductions that we can see. When you're doing taxes, it is all about ordinary and necessary. Being common is the key to avoid audits, to avoid extra speculation. When you go outside of what the norm is, that's when you might draw a little bit of attention. And so that's okay to draw that extra attention, you just need to make sure it's worth it. If we're gonna run a little bit more risk of getting an audit, if we're gonna run a little bit more risk of somebody saying, no, that deduction doesn't count, let's make sure it's worth it. But people don't always know what's common. And so that's why I'm gonna talk about the top five deductions. Please keep in mind, the person that is super, super, super conservative on their taxes and the person that's super, super aggressive, they run the exact same amount of risk in terms of getting audited because they're not the ordinary. Um, so being common and ordinary or basic, as the kids are saying, is really, really, really one of the best ways to keep yourself kind of under the radar. Okay, one of the top uh, five deductions that we're seeing is marketing and advertising expenses. Since COVID, people have moved to in-person and online. You have two different kind of lives that you need to maintain. When you're marketing as, uh, as real estate agents or brokers, you're marketing online and you're marketing in person. If you have your own business doing something else, again, even for tenants, you know, you if you're not putting signs out there for tenants, but also pushing for tenants online, you're going to lose some of the pool. So marketing and advertising expenses have gone up significantly in the last few years, but that is normal. That is because uh, we are doing two different platforms. So marketing, advertising expenses are so, 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 so common. Professional supplies and equipment. This again is something that has been birthed out of COVID as well. I was lucky enough to have one of those jobs where I was able to go home and work, but thus I had to build an entire office at my house. Then COVID kept going on and I ended up going to uh, going even a little bit further. And I now have three offices. I'm currently in the office office, but I have one at my house. I have one a little bit further east. Um, and that is equipment, that is supplies, that is things that I need for my business to run. You need computers, you're going to need um, extra tables. These are professional supplies that you are purchasing. I have a TV in my office. This is common. This is something that you can deduct. And if you're not deducting, it's like why you're using it, you're, you paid for it, why aren't you taking this deduction? Um, especially in the real estate world, this is huge. You guys are always on the go. People are working out of cafes. People are working in their cars. They're doing all types of things because luckily the world has made it so that you can be a little bit more mobile. And so those things that you purchase for helping you be more mobile, for helping you move around, those supplies are deductible. Car and truck expenses. This really depends a lot on how uh, you are structured, whether you're a sole proprietorship, whether you're a partnership or an S Corp, and we can go more into that a little bit later, but car and truck expenses are common. We're in Southern California. Southern California people are driving more than any other place in the United States statistically. And so these expenses that people are incurring, you need to account for it. If you're getting your car fixed, it's not a personal expense for you to be getting your car fixed completely. It, it, it is partially because you're running around with your business, or it might be fully because you're running around with your, with your business if you have a car dedicated to your business. If you get your car wrapped, um, if, as you're getting your car detailed because you're putting a client in it or something like this, these expenses, these small expenses that people are not accounting for are the things that you need to be thinking about and making sure you're accounting for. Gas, 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 gas. It's outrageous. When you total all the gas that you're purchasing, it's, it's absolutely insane. Legal and professional fees. This one is one that I'm constantly asking my clients about. I'm like, 
where's my fee you paid me last year? And they're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And I'm like, that's deductible. You're doing it for your business. You're getting a notary. If you're having somebody look at contracts, you hired an attorney to look at your contracts. These fees that you are paying, if you had somebody go out to a building to get surveyed, if you do a cost seg, if you are doing a 1031 and you're a accommodator, these professional and legal services are fully, fully deductible. Property deductions. Property deductions, especially for those in the real estate market, are ginormous. They are huge. They are a large part of what you are able to deduct. And they're also one of the more fun things that you can do to allow yourself to either grow or stabilize. And so I'm going to use both of those as examples because there's two kind of different types of people that are investors. We have the investors that are trying to grow, grow, grow and get bigger and bigger and acquire more and more. And then you have also those that have that fluctuation that go up and down, up and down. Uh, whether like if you're flipping, if you're doing constant flips, then you're probably going to go up and down, up and down, which means sometimes you could have really crazy high um, tax and then sometimes you have like no tax. But stabilizing that to balance yourself out is something in the tax world that we really pay attention to because we can run into AMT. And AMT gets really, really annoying and can get hit really hard right when you least expect it. And so stabilizing yourself will also make you pay a lower tax rate. What are some of these deductions that we have? Uh, cost segs could be property deductions. Obviously, you've got people accelerating that depreciation so that they can use that accelerated depreciation on their tax savings and then go purchase other things. In the tax world with properties, there's a plethora that you can do. It is all about what is your situation? How does it stand in your situation? Because if you are not a real estate professional, you can have uh, what it is passive losses. Real estate is passive for people that are not real estate professionals or people that aren't married to a real estate professional. If you're filing married, filing joint, regardless of how many, uh, how many properties you have, if you have another job for like myself, me, um, I have over 32 properties, but it's all passive for me because I have another job and I spend the majority of my time at that other job. And so I have these passive losses because real estate generally is going to be a um, it's going to be tax free. Like your rental income that you're getting is usually tax free. However, passive losses don't go anywhere. They follow you and they can be used greatly. <coughs> Excuse me. They can be used greatly when you're trying to sell or if you are having a lower time, if you lose your job, you can now switch some of these passive losses to be beneficial to you. So are passive losses deductible? Passive losses can go against passive gains. How can you use bonus depreciation to help you with that? So if you are accelerating your depreciation and you have bonus depreciation, you can use that as a long-term play. You're basically just pulling your depreciation forward. So you're purchasing a property. The property is now getting depreciated over 27 point five years, you say, no, 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 I want to take that depreciation and I want to move some of that forward. I don't want to have it just slowly dripping out to me like a little spitting of deductions. You want to pull it forward to use it so you can have a higher deduction in the few years. This is wonderful if you believe you're going to have a property that is going to produce some, it's going to be some heavy cash flow. Um, this works really well. You don't even need to be a real estate investor or to be a real estate professional, excuse me, if you're doing this because you might have a property that you decide, hey, for the next two, three years, I want to Airbnb it. That could be super heavy cash flow. And so you can now 
pull some of your accelerated depreciation forward and use that depreciation so that you are not getting hit with that heavy tax bit. You can also make some of that real estate, that uh, Airbnb as non-passive if you also are doing some specific things to help it. But bonus depreciation is a wonderful thing. Please keep in mind, California does not recognize bonus depreciation unless it's under some really specific circumstances. One of those specific circumstances is a cost segregation study. Cost segregation study is one way that California will recognize bonus depreciation. The federal government absolutely does recognize bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation, as we all know, is also phasing out. Right, we are at eighty percent of what we're able to take. Uh, next year, we'll be at sixty, and it keeps going, going. However, there is a bill that is in the process of being passed. I don't know if it will be passed or not, but it is in the process that will allow for a hundred percent depreciation. I know, like two years ago, everybody was getting really crazed about I want to get a car for work, and um, so I can take all the depreciation. It needs to be over six thousand pounds. Everybody was really, really into that. And I'm like, why don't you just buy a property, and then you can have a larger, more stable investment than a car, and you can take that same amount of depreciation you were going to put in the car into your property actually even more um and so that ability is slowly going away but the law that allowed bonus depreciation was put in place and the for effective in 2018 during the trump uh, tax codes he wasn't the first one to do it. Reagan did it before him. Reagan wasn't the first one to do it. And so this is a common thing. They phase out, they come back, they phase out, they come back. I've been speaking for a good little minute. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, if not, I can go on. Are there any questions for Nicole? All right, keep going, Nicole. <laughs> okay. All right, what about short-term versus long-term investing? So we have several people that are all about the short-term. That's for people that are thinking about the gains, right? We're thinking about gains. Can you be doing flips and not get hit with short-term capital gain? Short-term capital gain is the worst. And the answer is absolutely yes. You absolutely can. If you're doing real estate flipping um, for business purposes and you are considering this a business, then you're able to move these gains into ordinary income. And so now we're not getting hit with 40% uh, tax rates because we have that short-term gain. Now we're getting hit with ordinary income tax rates, but you need to be doing it for business because somebody that is consistently selling t-shirts, they are getting hit with gains. And it's that same theory. If you're consistently selling properties, if you're doing this as a business, as opposed to like, yeah, I saw this on the side, then we're not looking at capital gains. Long-term investing for people that are trying to put in and save and hold. These people can have, one, you can fully avoid capital gains. Two, you can also have what we call tax-free income for a very long time. Sometimes I have people that come to me and they say, Nicole, I want you to lower my taxes. And I look at them and I say, I, there's nothing we can do. You're on W-2, your spouse is on W-2, there's, there, there's minimal we can do to lower your taxes. I was like, however, I can show you ways where you can have more income and keep the exact same tax you pay. Not the same rate, but the same amount of tax that you pay because there's ways for people, i.e. real estate, can get into the markets and grow income tax-free. And those usually are for long-term investing. And so really you need to think again, what is your way of thinking about this? What are you trying to look for? It was very similar when they when you were asking like, what type of investor are you? Are you looking for cash flow or appreciation? It's that same kind of idea. If you're looking for cash flow, you might be more into the short term type of person. If you're looking for appreciation, that's long term investing. I tell people for that are into the long term investing, it's like you're having really big, high growing savings accounts that give you small little dividends, you know, that, that are coming through because your properties can definitely cash flow um, even if you're long-term investing. 
The only thing about short-term and long-term investing that people struggle with and can get hit with is when you're flip-flopping. When you're flip-flopping, if you're saying like, hey, I'm going short-term and then the market completely crashes and things like that, and you're not set up appropriately, and then you decide to go um, and rent everything out, that can have an issue with your tax strategy. And so you need to make sure you're understanding of what you want to do. Obviously, the market can change and you can decide, hey, I need to rent this out. And so you need to set yourself up very cleanly <laughs> with your entity structures um, so that you're able to rent out things. Entity structures are huge, 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 huge part of taxes. How well do you how well do you give yourself a framework can have a really big implication in your tax savings. When I talk about entity structures, am I talking about an LLC? Am I talking about a C-corp? Am I talking about an S-corp? So really the golden rule is let's not put a property inside a corporation. Just let's not put a property inside the corporation. You can have a lot of tax with a property inside a corporation. However, that doesn't make corporations bad. S-corps and C-corps are wonderful. And S-corps really, really, you can see the biggest savings with um, because you get to avoid that self-employment tax just like or Oh, not avoid it, limit it. Um, LLCs are w amazing ways for people to put properties in, um, have a little bit of extra protection, and still you can have the benefit of an S corporation, which I'll talk about the benefits of with the LLC. You can simply have your properties inside LLCs and have your S corporation be the mother, be the owner of these LLCs, and then you are able to have all that income flow up because the best way for you to have tax savings is when you have everything condensed into one. Because if you have a bunch of things over here, I have a W-2 job, I have a property here, I'm getting dividends over here, I have this investment over there. And if you have all of these different things, you get hit with different rules. Like, am I going to get net investment tax over here? Am I going to get self-employment tax over there? Um, am I going to get hit with retirement limitation? You have all of these things going around and you can have it be the same thing to multiple Thing. So you can have a self-employment requirement over there and you can have another self-employment requirement over there. And so now you're paying self-employment again and again and again. But if you can condense all of that by having it all flow into a into a escort, probably you are now going to be just limiting where the rules lie. And it's just going to be one time. And that's where you can really see some of the benefits. So. S corps and LLCs are what we call pass through entities, meaning the actual company themselves don't really pay tax. Um, yes, if you're in California, your S corp or your LLC is in California, you're going to pay like the minimum eight hundred dollars to the state, but that's like a parking ticket. You know, that's just like a little fee you pay for parking. That's not the actual tax. The tax is going to flow to you personally. That income is going to flow to you personally. And so on your personal return, you are going to see the tax. C-Corps themselves pay tax. And so people love C-Corps, um, one, because if they have a high tax rate, that C-Corp can pay tax. But C-Corps uh, can pay a lower tax because C-Corps have a flat tax, which is very nice. One key thing about the C-Corp is the C-Corp, you can get hit with double tax. Uh, people think of it as a double tax, but it's, it's not really. But because the C-Corp is like its own big mama, <laughs> that it's its own entity, you can have the C-Corp pay tax, you pull money, and then you're going to pay tax out of off the money that you're pulling from that C-Corp. With S-Corps, LLCs, you don't have any of that issues because it's passed through entities. Um, S-Corps limit people from paying self-employment tax. So like, let's imagine I have several rentals and I also manage them. So I'm paying a management fee to myself or I am I'm managing some other people's stuff. So now my LLC is producing income. If I have $100,000 of profit, I'm paying $15,000 in just self-employment tax. And on top of that, I'm going to pay income tax as well on top of that $100,000 or for that $100,000, excuse me. S-Corps say like, hey, you are owner and employee of the company. And so you need to pay yourself 
running payroll. Your payroll is not going to be for that entire $100,000. Your payroll is going to be for a portion of that $100,000 because remember, you're two things. The owner needs to get paid and then you as the employee needs to get paid. So we run a payroll for, let's say, $40,000 and right there I'm paying $6,000 in payroll taxes, which is the same as self-employment tax, as opposed to that $15,000 and then I pay a hundred, I pay uh, income tax on the whole hundred. And so right there, you're saving yourself $11,000 just in tax. The rules that people have or the rules that are existing for accounting also change depending on the entity. If you're a sole proprietor and you want to take uh, your if you want to take your, your transportation, you might find it easier and better to take miles because you're not really able to take 100% of the gas or 100% of your car, et cetera. While if you're in an S Corp, you can take, you know, almost those full deductions, depending on what your particular situation is. And so the actual record keeping is going to be a lot easier for you. You can also do extra little benefits because you are running payroll, you know, by having like uh, a daycare, per, uh, a benefit of daycare. You can give yourself the HSAs, you know, these types of things. So, you know, having $5,000 of tax-free money just so that you can spend it on your own kids going to school or daycare is you know quite nice and Nicole, that is also in addition to um your normal tax uh your normal child uh deductions nicole so i just uh this is will i just wanted to give you a heads up uh you know we we, we as you yes. i know you have a hard out 11 we have a hard out 11 so i you know if you want to just maybe wrap up and see if there's any questions yeah yeah this is actually a perfect time to 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 stop if if there are any questions, let me know. Um, I thought, um, you know, that piece that you had about the short term versus the long term um, investing, that's very important because definitely we get folks who are interested in doing Airbnb type, you know, short term rentals, and then they you know, and then they realize how hard that is and then they have to they want to switch. So I, I definitely see that in, in our, in our, you know, daily practice, you know, that we, we, yeah, we just, people we wanting to do Airbnbs, people wanting to do flippings, you know, those types of things, uh, people can run and if you're not well versed in it you can run into really high tax rates but there's ways to structure yourself so that you're not hitting with these high tax rates and you're still able to get the full bit because people are saying like oh i want to do an airbnb and i want to put it as a business so it's schedule c well where are you putting your depreciation it becomes kind of a little give and take but you can actually end up doing both types of things you just need to make sure you're following some of the rules with it because there's some simple rules to for people to follow Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, I mean, those are the types of questions we get asked a lot. And like you, like you mentioned, you know, there are just so many as a property investor and as a real estate professional, there's just so many deductions, I think, that uh, we're unaware of. Well, how can we? The, the tax code is so complex. And so that's why it's so important to have uh, consultants like you, you know, people who who work in this field. Who, who do this for a living, who can tell us. Cause I mean, yeah, there was the car thing. I did the car thing. <laughs> like, I, I did, I did all that stuff, you know, because it was just like, yeah, we, we needed the, the write-offs that year, you know? So every year is different, obviously, you know, and, and, you know, I think for a lot of real estate professionals, it's been a challenging, you know, a couple of years, you know, ever yeah. since the interest rates have gone up and I'm sure you've seen that in your practice. Uh, we've definitely seen it in our uh, amongst our investors as well as our own portfolio. But during these yeah. challenging times is even more important because you really can see the savings that people can have on their tax returns. They can just pull so much money um, that they would have normally had or normally not had because now it's a challenging time, something dipped here and there's ways for people to take back their tax and now they can use that, have some be a little bit more liquid so that they can, you know, keep growing. Absolutely, absolutely. We only have a minute or two left. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Naomi, go ahead. Okay, Nicole. Um, so I need a... 
tax professional, so I definitely need to reach you. So how okay. can I be your friend, best friend? Can I have your personal phone number, your housing, so I can come to <laughs> your cake and then get to know you? But anyways. Right <laughs> there. Just, I'm kidding. So, um, I you see that. Like, send me uh, an email. The email would be better. QR or code. code. Um, you know, I saw that couple of different like options. So what would be the um easiest way to kind of um, send me an email? Email. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So email. here's her email. It's nicole.green at robberhalltaxes.com. There's also a QR code here. You know, uh, for for those of you who are interested in reaching out to her, definitely having Nicole as a best friend, I, I think would be a great idea. But Nicole only has so much time, particularly because it's tax season. <laughs> it's so. true. But we still, we're here all the time. And I, I can't say that I don't mind talking with people because one, it furthers my thought process. I'm a real estate investor heavily in the market. And so it's always great to see what other people are doing. And then it, 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 it it's really nice. Like, I enjoy it. Absolutely. Time. And that's why we have these. Um, and I'm actually going to be speaking at your meetup, the Robert Hall meetup yes. you know, next month. Uh, so excited for that opportunity. And um, yeah, are there any other questions? This is our last uh, few seconds before we have to jump. Oh, uh, I would like to know about the meetup information. Absolutely. Send me an email. I'll send you a link. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Just, and don't forget to tell me inside the email, like, hey, what's that meetup you were talking about? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so unless there are any other questions, I think we'll close it out. We want to thank Nicole Green from Robert Hall and Associates uh, so much for her uh, insight. You know, hopefully you guys got something. I definitely did. It's always good to know about your taxes, <laughs> especially as a real estate investor. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always fun. It's great. Always great to have Robert Hall with us. Thank you so much. And um, again, my name is Will Tiao. Uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, with any questions, uh, you know, on the multifamily market. And I look forward to, to speaking with all you offline. All right. Thanks so much.